Welcome or welcome back to the Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. You know, I've been thinking a lot about digital marketing and communications, you know, partly because that's what I do, but really I'm thinking about how we as persuaders and storytellers can get our message out to the right people in the right place at the right time, you know, primarily using digital tools and social media platforms and maybe some advertising. You know, there's, a quite, there's quite a lot at our disposal. You know, but the thing is, when you really get down to it, we're really not here to put our message in, or products in front of people, right? We're really here to listen to what people are asking for and then help them in the unique and special ways that we can. You know, at least the marketers who, are, who want to survive into the future, I think, need to think this way. We're here to have conversations, to build trust and relationships. So how can marketers do that in a meaningful way without screwing things up? Well, my guest today helps her clients do exactly that and more as we're about to learn. She's a brand and social strategist, digital marketer, storyteller, public speaker, and a content expert who is passionate about why marketing matters. She's a digital and brand strategist for Atomic Revenue, co-founder of content marketing firm, Fast Bryant Consulting. Please welcome to the show, the incredible Lauren Fast. Oh, I'm not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I... You know, Dan, that was that was really, really well done. And not just thank you because it's making me smile and turn bright red. But when you were prepping me for, I think I've done this, like I've done my homework and I'm excited to share this. So those of you that are listening need to know that I had no idea what Dan was about to share. And I concur. I think you did a lovely job. Thank you. That makes thank me you very so much. proud. I <laughs> I think I said some the last show, maybe even the show before that, and I'm going to keep saying this. I'm not big on the research, right? I mean, I have a day job and I love doing this. I love podcasting because it's about conversation for me and it's about curiosity and discovering great things, cool things about people who I know are fascinating because I've even, I've met them introduced to me by fascinating people. So by the, I guess the principle of transitivity, you're automatically fascinating if you've been uh, introduced to me as the way I way I, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt in that respect. But you know, look, there's a little bit I think you got to look at look at. And and I met Lauren at uh, the uprising, uh, which I mentioned on my last show or the last last show. And um, uprising is kind of that that anti conference that I mentioned where we uh, we uh, we were gathered by the wonderful and great Mark Schaefer. About thirty or forty, about there was about forty of us, I think. Yes. In a very kind of unique is the word, but exclusive is another word I would look for, you know, kind of invite only and only a certain number of people can go. And I, I feel like part of a, I belong to a special club because I've been to the uprising, but Lauren was there, you know, we met and I had to, I just had to have her on the show. So Lauren, thank you for coming. And I've been blabbing enough. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And thank you for saying it. The way that I have repeated the experience of the uprising, and then I have, I have had since then, I've been on four public speaking opportunities about the type of work that I do. And I have this segment that I share when people are the very beginning level of understanding marketing and, and why it matters. So I really appreciate that you had why, you know, marketing matters or that making marketing matter is one of the titles of a talk that I do. And so I appreciate that you had that in the intro because I frequently use that word or bring it up in why it is we craft content the way that we do. It's, it must matter to the intended audience. So that's a separate conversation. But what matters too is that when someone wants to hire or consider adding to a budget for a company, effective marketing, quality marketing, my suggestion to them is always make sure that you go to a practiced, an active practitioner and a professional. If you are wanting to initiate a marketing department and have someone bring other people in to tactively execute, great. But the person at the helm of that situation needs to be someone who is not whatever, what I hear small businesses do so often. I'm just going to have a young person come in and take care of it. They're young, so they know what to do. <laughs> They've been on the Facebook. I'm, right. The Facebooks. They know, they understand the interwebs. I'm going to have this high schooler. A so-and-so has a high school uh, nephew and they like to tinker with 
uh, you know, whatever it is on their phone. So then they assume that that person would be an advantageous individual to bring in for those situations because no one else in the office knows or understands the technology. Yeah. By the way, I just have to I have to interrupt. Like, you know, if you've ever been to a PR pitch or a marketing agency pitch and they bring like 45 people into the room to kind of, you know, to pitch you mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, you have this this array of, of people. It's like you always know who the digital people are, like the people who are going to who are about to present you their social media plan or their digital strategy, because it's always the two youngest people on the team. Right. Always. So I, I appreciate you saying that, but I almost feel like I want to put that on Mythbusters. Yeah. Because, Dan, my observation was that the average age of the individual and the uprising. So this was a powerful, exclusive, unique think tank of global marketers in three days worth of sessions to talk about what we've seen, what's coming, what's going, what do we imagine the future to look like? What is the horizon of marketing? as active practitioners. And then the young students, and I say young students because there were two graduate students that had been granted the opportunity to attend. My favorite part was when they were saying, everything that, and and the young lady was from West Virginia, everything that y'all are talking about, we just learned in class. And so my favorite part of this was all the middle-aged folks in this conference, because the average age was probably in the 40s, Everyone that was in the conference is actively doing and practicing and trying and testing the things that is turning into the delivered version of curriculum in a marketing program today. Because if you imagine what a marketing program looked like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago, what we're doing now is not even what they taught then. Yeah. I've always thought that the the concept of printing a static medium, you know, making a book about marketing is always such an interesting concept because it captures what's happening at that very moment at print. But just immediately, as soon as technology advances, so do the practices. But misnomer that a young person could take care of all of it. <laughs> I was merely merely commenting on what the firms think that the clients want to see. Yes. And they do. Right. And you're right, because that's yeah. what they believe is the right way to go. So totally. But it's, it's very interesting. And so uh, sorry, I interrupted you, though. And uh, you were talking about um, about the digital marketing, about getting starting to get into the whole idea of digital, I think. Yeah. So I, I may have forgotten where I was going because I got so excited about it. Yeah. And I was talking fast. Yeah, we were talking about the uprising, basically, and, uh, you know, just getting into it a little bit there. Yeah. And so when you you mentioned that that is, in fact, where we met the opportunity there, too, because I think that the uprising, Marcus typically hosted that in person Mm -hmm. and wanted to host that in person. And so you and I, Dan, are both in a really unique position to say that we are part of the crew that has signed up to go to the next uprising in person. Yes, we are pre in person. We're we're (laughs) in person to be. We are, you know, pandemic pending. (laughs) <laughs> Still pandemic pending. Yeah. It, I guess so. I guess so. Although I'm just going to drive there. So we should be good if that's possible. Yeah. I'm thinking of driving too. It's actually, actually, it's, it's, it's only about a nine or 10 hour drive for me. So I'm thinking about it. It's only all day. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Dan, you were asking me earlier, like, let's, let's talk about, you know, with respect to the uprising, you know, where we've been, where we're going, what's on the horizon for marketing. And let's let some of that be a bit of the structure for this, because I think that that's where my brain is going right now. Absolutely. I'm happy to do that. Thanks for taking over the show. No, <laughs> you had a really interesting question earlier about how does one go from, you know, the beginnings of what you have marked on your LinkedIn? Yeah. What did you notice on my LinkedIn? So that's right. So you started off in, in beauty. I did. Right. How do you go from, from beauty? And you can talk a little bit about what exactly what that means, because, you know, I, and I will freely admit, I have dabbled in the beauty business a a little bit. My listeners maybe don't even know this. And when I say I dabbled a little bit, obviously I'm not doing it anymore because I'm clearly not suited for the beauty business. That said, I kind of know a little bit about it. So it's fascinating to me to see how you got from after college and into the beauty business. Where do you go from there? How you get to ultimately be on the uprising? You know, one of those, I'm not going to say middle aged because, but one of those members of a global think tank of future looking marketers, but going from the beauty business to getting to the point where you are basically an entrepreneur co-founding your own digital marketing and branding consultancy and working for also like a consultant at Atomic Revenue, helping companies to, to do better marketing. So you're doing two things. You basically have two businesses going, plus you're public speaking, you're attending conferences and living on a farm. So there's a lot going on there in, in, in Lauren Fast's life. You know, how did that happen? What's the line? Oh, I love it. 
Uh, so the line gets really wide sometimes and gets really, really thin in others. But I, I do often maximize my bandwidth and utilize all of it. I do have a very intentionally hectic schedule because it is just about using the gifts that you're given when you're given them. So I, I 100% move at full speed all the time, not just because it's my last name. So you are asking about my start, and I actually enjoy this a great deal because when I went to college in 97, I was studying sports medicine. I wanted to be the first female athletic trainer in the NFL. I loved standing on the sidelines. I loved evaluating, uh, really focusing on the care and prevention of athletic injuries. I wanted to do that ever since I was in high school. And to this day, I love understanding mechanism of injury. And then with my own sons who were both athletic and the, and the youngest is, is really in the peak of his athletic life as far as a high schooler goes, observing his injuries and muscle soreness and such and, and, and his gait <laughs> and, and working with him still at home. It just re- helps me to remember some of the things I think I learned when I was in college. But I, I got pregnant and married right out of college very quickly. And that did not lead directly to any type of employment. So at pretty early, I was just raising children. I had two boys, you know, my first son when I was 22, my second son when I was 24. And I did things out of the house. Entrepreneurially, I had little businesses out of the house. Like I did things and I sold things and I really enjoyed that. And I became a substitute teacher when they were both in school because that schedule worked very well with the age of my children. And I was able to make some money and take care of them at the same times that they needed to be taken care of. So in and out of school, I was in and out of work at the very same time. That worked extremely well. Teaching at that point became a foundation for a lot of other things that I would then do. So you may know that I think being an educator or teaching is just the ability to share a concept to multiple individuals at one time and have them all understand it. And that version of focusing on differentiated education is the same way that a company can adequately convey their differences or their features and advantages and benefits or their purpose to the vast array of individuals that they choose to do business with while being able to focus on their target. It's interesting you said that. And it now just occurred to me that, you know, I had Park Howell on the show a little while ago and he was talking about, you know, obviously storytelling and he was a, an educator as well. He still is an educator. I had um, Neil Schaefer on the show. He's an educator. You know, Mark Schaefer who has not been on the show is an educator, but you know, I was a teacher at, at, at earlier in my life. I wonder if there's a special advantage that people who teach have when it comes to storytelling. I mean, you know, storytelling is the core, is at the core of content. It's at the core of, of certainly PR and, mar- and communications, which is sort of my side of the fence, if there is a fence. But, you know, it just, we can put a pin in that. But you being a substitute teacher, I wonder what that, how, how heavy of an influence that had on your, on your ability, your skill, maybe, to persuade in story form. Because there's no other way that you can get through to kids, really, than to tell them stories. You know, it's, it's, a, it's the most effective way to, to communicate with them. It helps them to imagine. And when they can start to imagine, they start to make those connections. And I do believe that that's the case for all ages. It wasn't so much that it was how much of that turned into this ability, but it was recognizing that I had that skill set. When you you become a substitute teacher, I did it first because it was convenient. And at the time, it paid very well for someone who wanted to leave the house at will and be gone at a very specific or finite period of time, back when people left the house to work. Let's also remind ourselves of that. When was that? I don't remember that. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) And I discovered that I really loved it. So I actually went back to school to be a teacher. And I took online classes at the same time. Meanwhile, and this is where the beauty comes in. Ah. I was introduced to a beauty brand or what I used to call the image business. And we did color theory. We did color analysis. We worked with skincare. We worked with makeup. And I very quickly enjoyed it and grew and grew a very successful team and grew in rankings in the company because in the uh, multi-level marketing world, there's always a rank to achieve that is above you, that is illustrious and pays more. And I actually got to the point where after six years of teaching, I was making more money in the image industry than I was in teaching. And then I had more control over my schedule and I liked it and I could stay home. So I absolutely made that switch 
in 2012. So I had been working in the image business for just a couple of years. And I made that switch and went full time into the image business. But that was the thing that we like to say that you could, you know, have a part time job with a full time income, blah, blah, blah. Yep. I've heard that before. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I really enjoyed it. I started Facebook Live. I started when, when Facebook Live was first made possible. I mean, my very first video is like everybody's first video. It's terrible. It's horrid. I can't believe I did it. I can't believe I was proud of it, but I was. I was so excited that I did that. But because I was in the image industry and doing live video, it was very interactive. And I discovered then, this is, gosh, I can't even remember what year this was. Is this 2015 or 14 that live video became a thing on Facebook? I'll have to look that up. I actually don't remember. But it broke down the roads and walls that separated me between my home and my potential customers. Yeah. Where we know now, post-pandemic, that that's just how we do business because we Zoom into each other's households and we have these conversations with FaceTime and such all the time. Then that was not the case at all. Oh, yeah. You were trailblazing. I hosted a show called What to Wear Wednesday. And it was uh, like gamified makeup. I would say my makeup, you decide. So I would hold up two choices and the audience would let me know through the comments what they wanted to see because I would demo makeup and I would teach them how to put it on. We did that every Wednesday. There are still women that send me messages that say, I really miss your morning Wednesdays. I got ready with you every day. It was super, (laughs) well, it was wonderful. And on that show, this is where I started to transfer. I I took some of that content and I started making it in YouTubes and I would take before and after pictures and I made all of the image content for a particular lipstick line, all the image content for uh, blushes, eyeshadows, eyeliners, um, all the different particular products that had color background. I would then take in a studio. I have this really awesome studio with fantastic lighting and I would take the images and that's what the company would then use to share online. Mine and a couple of other ladies, but that's where they put on Instagram. That's what was on Facebook. That's what they shared in all of the glossies. So as an active practitioner, and this was something that we just started doing, like this is where our customers are. So we met our customers where they were. I really started to formulate a plan and understand what worked well. On the show one day, and Dan, you have prep, right? Uh, and, and in my case at the time, I had a bad case of gas, which was gear acquisition syndrome. And I had all these great lights and backdrops and and lifts and levels. And my my video show was a, a production. And I started using a DSLR for my recordings. I would use Ecamm Live to do the live videos. I would have, sw- I mean, I did all kinds of fun stuff. It was really, really great. And one day on the show, I was using a teacup. And the teacup was a basic white, like diner teacup. It was part of my dining set. I had done extensive setup on this set. And one of the women commented, there's a chip in your teacup. Yeah. And I will tell you, Dan, it set me back for a second. But this is interestingly a part of my story. And I paused. And I remember like having a visceral reaction, like sweating, like, oh, something's not perfect. I wanted all of this to be perfect. And I looked down at my teacup. I said, well, I... I love this teacup and it's wonderful. And I I like the way my coffee tastes in it. And I like using it. I like waking up in my morning and cheersing to all of you because I would tip the teacup into the camera like good morning and cheers. Mm -hmm. And I think that this proves that even though the teacup is flawed, it's my favorite and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. And I have flaws and I think I can be wonderful. And some of you may have flaws and you're wonderful. And I think that on this show that we celebrate all things that are beautiful. So Ooh, did you just come up with that on like one on the show? No, this show actually like exists. I should in find the flow. it. Yes. Oh, I was like sweating as I was saying it. I said, so I, yeah, my, my teacup has a chip in it, but I love it and it's wonderful. And I'm going to keep using it because it makes me happy. And we went through that season. People sent me teacups and I, I collect, I have like 50 more teacups. I have every kind of interesting, fun teacup. People find them in antique shops and they still send them to me. And I take pictures of them sometime or I say I enjoy my coffee in these fancy teacups. And if they get a chip in and we say, you know, we like it all the better because it has a flaw. Now, that translated extremely well in the image business, but it carries through all the work that I continue to do because no version of what I was trying to do was ever going to be perfect. It needed to be authentic. It needed to be real. I had to resonate with the women who were on the other side of the camera. Why did they want to spend time with me? 
because I would tell them like it was and I would make a mistake and I'd be like, oh, here's how you fix that. And I would show them how we did that live. And everything about the work that I did there was training for what I was going to do in the future. Yeah. It was July 20th, 2017 that the parent company for that beauty brand edited their entire North American beauty business. And all of us in the United States and Canada and Puerto Rico lost our jobs that day. Hey, we're closing our doors in August. You guys have like 30 days to close your your business, tell your people. And some of us had really large teams. That was really, really sad. And it was at that moment I realized that no version of a beautiful tapestry woven rug that I thought was my gorgeous foundation for my beautiful business was ever going to be permanent. And the rug would always be pulled out from underneath me if I wasn't creating a really solid foundation for my business, if I wasn't the foundation for my business, or if my business wasn't rooted in something that people would always need, that there would always be a problem and I would always have the solution for it. Makeup was a a desire. It wasn't essential but it was helpful. So what do businesses need for commerce to continue to exist? So that weekend, I think I told you this earlier, Dan, uh, the weekend that that business announced that they were closing, a publicly traded company, I, like many of the other women that were leaders, received multiple job offers. And I I was like, I'm never going to sell another lipstick as long as I live. Like, that's just, I'm done with that. Like that hurt, it broke my heart. It hurt my feelings. I still do makeup to this day. I'm still a freelance makeup artist on the weekends. I do weddings, proms, photos, everything. I mean, all kinds of things. But I didn't do that business anymore. I said, if 47 other companies want me to do what I was doing for them, I don't have time to negotiate with 47 companies, but I do have time to figure out my own thing. So I explored some employment options for about a year. And then one of my girlfriends had a situation who is accredited in public relations, by the way, my business partner, April Bryant, who is the Bryant of Fast Bryant Consulting, recognized that she was no longer going to be in the employment that she was. And so she contacts me in tears. And this is after I've spent time like in the fetal position because my job is, you know, (laughs) not what it once was, right? Like I took a month off just crying and sobbing and I wish I could say I lost weight during that time, but I didn't. The rug is the pulling the rug out is a fantastic analogy for that, though. I mean, I I can't I can't get the metaphors out of my head. You you just because you keep rolling with them, the the flawed teacup, Mm -hmm. the rug under you. I mean, you know, we can continue to talk about that for sure. It's just it's the core to making things understandable and putting things in a way that you know a relatable and relevant way. But it's the authenticity of the whole moment that I think was the winner there. And that really told the story like so perfectly well. I mean, it's just, you know, and now, so now you're sitting in the fetal position and you're, and, <laughs> and uh, your friend yeah. April reaches out to you. Yeah. <laughs> I said, okay, this is it. This is it. We can do this together alone. I don't know that I felt like I could do what I needed to do. Head of household. She's head of household. You know, we were both the primary income earners for our homes. How were we going to replace this income as women in an environment in a rural area where women in leadership is not applauded like it is in some places. And in an environment where I want to say where I grew up and the family environment that I had was not supportive of a woman being intelligent and a woman being powerful and a leader and starting her own business. I was probably supposed to get a job and work for someone else and just earn my paycheck and be you know, a good little girl and go home and take care of my family and my house and just do the things that the traditional family recognizes what a woman does. And I was like, I'll take care of my darn self. And (laughs) (laughs) it's not going to be in the way that everybody else recognizes. So we started a business. And one of the ways that made that so fluid is that we had both been working together. She was the director of community relations for a school district. So she'd been working in a government sector for quite some time. I was at that time one of the leaders of a local education foundation. And at the education foundation level, we had been asked to speak at NSFA, which now has a new name, but it was National School Foundation Association at the local conferences, regional conferences, national conferences. So we traveled to a variety of other states in in my nonprofit capacity as a volunteer, though public speaking has always been one of my favorite things to do. Our job started because we started as speakers 
And we would talk about how to develop effective communication plans to increase donor bases. That was the one thing that we did together that when she said, hey, school district X is not going to retain me on their staff. I passed their bond issue and now they don't need me anymore. And I was in the fetal position because I'd lost my job. Also, I was like, that's it. We're going to do our own thing because people wanted us and we knew that. So we worked backwards with a profit first mindset. How much money do each of our households need to make to run? And we wrote that dollar amount down. What package or service can we put together that costs X number of dollars? And how many of those do we need to sell to reach the amount of money that we need to make to run our households? And that's exactly how we built the business. And we started that way. And we've honestly just grown and developed and evolved since then. Through that process, Dan, is when I was recognized, not just from my work in the image industry, but then also establishing my own business with Fast Bryant Consulting by Atomic Revenue. So Steph Nissen at the time, now Steph Hermanson, because she got married in the spring. Steph Hermanson now, she was so Steph Nissen or Nissen Media. I met her at Social Media Marketing World in, I think it was 2018. It might have been 2017. I think it was 2018. It doesn't matter. We met in San Diego, but we realized we both live in Missouri. So we're like, oh, we don't have to go to California to have a conversation. Let's meet for coffee when we get back home. And so we did. And over the course of the next year, Steph really recognized my work and she saw what I was doing. And when I saw her at MDMC the following spring, which is Midwest Digital Marketing Conference held by uh, Perry Drake, who's in charge of UMSL Digital Marketing or Marketing at Digital uh, UMSL, she's like, I have an idea and I want you to meet my CEO and and we, we want to share this concept with you. We'd really like to bring you in to work on this. So I did join Atomic Revenue as a contractor to start the solopreneur division of the company because one of the things that I developed over the course of my time at, in the image industry is that when I was a national trainer for the company, I would teach 80 women in a single room how to start the very same business selling the exact same product for the very, very same price as all their friends and neighbors. And I really learned how to differentiate and develop individual personal brands. And they knew that. And so Atomic Revenue said, come do that for us. And that evolved into the executive branding program, which really turned into the core messaging program. And now I am one of the, I'm the only non-owner leader of Atomic Revenue as an employee. And I helped compose the current version of the core messaging program. Mm -hmm. And at Atomic Revenue, we are a revenue operations company, and we focus on all of the elements of revenue operations, which is every single touch point of your business with your customer journey from start to finish, from the go-to-market strategy through lead generation, through sales conversion and customer advocacy, all of the things that a business has cost and spend and then resultant profit. And we help fill the gaps and fix the issues that cause profit loss so that a company can scale and grow appropriately. And we are also a company that runs on EOS, which is the entrepreneurial operating system, which is why when I noticed Dan has the book yeah. traction behind him, I was like, I see traction behind you there. <laughs> Got traction behind, him, yeah. behind me. Yeah. You know? And, uh, you know, my good friend, Tracy Phillips, would, who, who was on my show a while back, would actually love that shout out mm -hmm. because, you mm -hmm. know, we, we do, I do a mastermind every couple of weeks with, Tracy and a few folks, a few amazing folks from, from North Carolina. And I think three of the four people on the group are EOS devotees. And I uh, like, like several of the books or many of the books you see behind me, I haven't read it in its entirety. <laughs> <laughs> I've done some of the worksheets in it though. It's pretty interesting because, you know, like I, I am, I'm a knowledge hungry person. That's why I do this show. Um, I love hearing about what people are doing. You know, when it comes to marketing and communications, there's a lot that I can learn and then pull into my job and 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 kind of transfer into my own day to day, right? Absolutely. When it comes to uh, sales, well, I'll pick up some amazing information from my guests, and then I'll be able to now now I can relate better to my sales teams in my company. So you know, look, hey, I was just talking to the expert. I know what you're talking about, right? I I get you. And, uh, you know, and I may even have some interesting ideas. We can have a, have a coffee or a beer and when we used to do those things and, you know, figure things out. But EOS is one of those things to square that circle. EOS is one of those things that, um, that uh, I hear about a lot. And um, 
so is that the main focus of how you help com- how you help companies with atomic revenues? Is, is it in implementing the the entrepreneurial operating system? Oh, it's it's not. I'm not an implementer. Okay. Uh, we are a use. We are a company that operates on EOS. Okay. One of the main ways that I help companies through atomic revenue is as a revenue operations director, mm-hmm. which is a fancy name for account manager. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, and then I also <laughs> do all of the core messaging. Or we have other. I have trained others and worked with others, but we do core messaging for companies that are either rebranding or in the position to begin their core messaging development, which includes a jobs to be done exercise. We do value propositions, problems, pains, resolutions, impact declarations, customer validation. uh, And we create a, a series of really incredible deliverables that then become the use of the language of the business for both internal and external use in all of their content development. So every public facing possibility or even for the sales training and and customer service teams training. You are creating the content framework, the content sort of Bible. Absolutely. I guess. Yes. For companies and generally speaking, small, mid-sized firms, or are you working with enterprise, larger companies as well? It is small to mid-sized businesses because the service that we provide at the fractional level is for companies that are not yet in a revenue position to hire a full service marketing team. So we operate with a subscription level marketing service. So instead of hiring a full-time senior level or junior level employee, you can get many mid-level or senior level fractional support members for the cost of like, you know, one junior level employee. So in a given, in a given week or month or, you know, whatever the time period is, Mm -hmm. How many clients or how many different brands are you like the fractional brand manager for or the fa- or the fractional, you know, comms manager for or the um, content marketer for? Obviously, I think you're wearing a bunch of different hats. As well. Yeah, I'm counting. I'm actually using my fingers right now. <laughs> I think it's about 15 a month. Goodness me. Mm-hmm. Goodness me. Yeah. And at, at, the, at a fractional level. That's the atomic revenue part of your... But that's a combination of Atomic Revenue and uh, Fast Bryant Consulting. At Atomic Revenue, I am doing that right now for five. Sorry, just to kind of clarify this a little bit. Sure. The Atomic Revenue is about the revenue points, right? Is is the, the gaps between, as you were saying, the, the profitability gaps. Yeah. And in that in particular environment, we work with uh, companies that are B2B in the engineering, manufacturing, and technology spaces primarily. Oh, right. Okay. So those are... Small to mid-sized businesses, and then our sweet spot in the EOS version. So our vision traction organizer says that we uh, our our ideal range of revenue is ten to eighty million dollars of annual recurring revenue is the company size that we uh, work with best. Interesting. And then at Fast Bryant Consulting, it's actually a B to C environment that we serve, and it is companies, small to mid-sized companies with one to five brick and mortar locations in a tri-county area that are dependent upon foot traffic in the service industry. That's really specific. It works. You know, we, we, on the uprising, that reminds me. So on the uprising, we talked a lot about. We did. Niching. Yes. Or niching. Yes. I can never get that word right. Niche or niche. (laughs) But uh, I always say niche, but, uh, but niching, it really turned into a verb during that, Mm -hmm. uh, during that discussion. And and it lasted through a couple of days. It was more than one day. Mm-hmm. It did last through a couple of days. A three day. It was a three day, you know, anti conference. But the conversation about niching was more than one day. Crazy, yeah. 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 So we had we talked about that a lot, and that's the extreme version of I think of what we were trying to talk about at at the uprising. Now the the uh, the opposite end is like my niche is not having a niche. Right? which which I think people who who haven't had the time to develop their niche will will lean on as a crutch like yours truly for my podcast I don't necessarily have a niche that I've defined and I kind of like it that way I kind of like being able to to speak with people I want to speak to which that's your niche Dan that's I guess that's my niche yeah yes. it's people I want to speak to well as Cliff said to me Cliff Ravenscraft said you know the most unique thing that you have about yourself is you and so I, you know, the guy, exactly. He's, we're, we're doing, I'm not worthy hand signals with, with our hands right now, <laughs> but yeah. exactly. So once actually, once Cliff even said that to me, said, what do you, you know, what do you need a name for? Just be you. you. You're your own unique voice. You're your own unique brand. Thank you. And that was 
the last push I needed over the cliff. The, the cliff. See, see what I did there? Your cliff Ravens. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, you know, so I I I think that it just I was just saying that your your business is your your target is extremely focused, you know, and it looks like it's working out very, very nicely. It is. It is working out nicely. But I think that when the broad part of that is in the service industry, there's lots of businesses that are in the service industry. And that is where we have some range. And there is uh, something that Gretchen Rubin has in her happiness project. And I read this many years ago, like 2009, but it's called freedom within your limitations. And once you give yourself your, and I'm just sort of making like a circle or a ball with my hands right now. Once you give yourself your boundaries or your limitations, you can swim all up in there until you are drowning, right? But the freedom within your limitations gives you that boundary to say, I can do anything I want inside this very specific zone. It's when I move out of the zone that either my skill sets are weaker or people don't completely understand what I'm providing. So that's one of the reasons why that works so well for us is when somebody outside of our zone says, hey, we would really like to hire you. We also get to just clarify, not just qualify, but clarify our process and how we work so that, and, and you've had previous podcast ses- guests say this, there's a lot more joy and satisfaction and fulfillment and the work that we do because we are in a position to say, this is what we do very well. We can recommend someone to you or within our network, I am entirely able to suggest another professional for what it is that you're requesting. While we could do it, it's not our secret sauce. This is where we work very well. And then I want to go back to what you said earlier about just be yourself. From a marketing perspective, I think that people work so hard to sound very clever. Oh, yes. They forget that their own selves, the way that they fluently communicate or that they represent or present on a regular basis is truly the authentic touch and differentiator that they need. When businesses try very hard to look plastic and then vague because <laughs> they want to appeal to everybody, it's oh yeah, really kind of thin. It doesn't catch attention. So when you said that someone told you that and that's what you need to tip over the edge, I think that's what businesses need to tip over the edge all the time is just to be reminded that, you know, whatever you say on a regular basis, how you act, how you look, your skills, your values, what you appreciate, how you're involved in your community, those are the winning answers. That's the information you market to people and they will choose to do business with you. And it starts with your values. It starts with with that core, those values and that purpose that we talk about all the time, that, you know, once you separate from that and sometimes larger companies, especially, but not only large companies, you know, that, but over time they separate from their original core values and they're surprised when a competitor comes and eats their lunch or they're, they're, they're surprised when the world moves on and they're no longer able to, you know, to make changes and make moves, you know, like the company I work for, in, in my my quote unquote day job, but it's, it's even silly to call it a day job anymore because we don't watch clocks. And plus I'm in an international role, right? So I run communications for the Americas for, for a major Japanese company, which means I have meetings on Japan time, on times that are more convenient for Europe. Uh, and then times for, of course, for our time zone here in the United States or time zones actually. So the idea of a day job is sort of funny, but a lot of what's kind of contributing to our success, I think, um, as a company and the company's Lixel and, you know, we, we have these great, great brands. And it's not just that everybody needs the products that we have. It's really that the company has taken a really close look at our culture and employees and understanding that, look, we need to really kind of get down to our values and a lot of time, effort, and budget, everything like you think it through is spent in the pursuit of living our values. And that goes to everything, it goes to hiring, it goes to, to, it goes to messaging. Now I, I'm very fortunate to be on the messaging side. So, so when you talk about messaging and things, it, it absolutely rev- resonates with Ben. And we're doing a lot with storytelling and it's just, I mean, it's so much fun when, you're, when you have, but what resonated uh, what about what we just said too was the idea of freedom within your limitations. So people look at, being at a corporate role, for example, as being very limiting. And you know what? There are limits. There certainly are limits. But within those limits, once I understand what my guardrails are, I have a lot of room to play. And 
you know, and if it's a good organization, I really think it is, then uh, whoever's above me gives me the room to play. And I, and I pass that room along to the people who work on my team, or at least I strive to on a day-to-day basis, you know, and I'm getting somewhere with this. What, what I really wanted to kind of get to was it's about what matters, like to circle back to what we talked about earlier. Meaningful and matters. Yes. Meaning and matter. Meaning, meaning matters. Yes. Uh, being meaningful matters. Authenticity matters a lot. You know, I can harken back to Glenn Zimmerman who was on my show. We talked, we talked about a uh, kid practicing trombone and it's like, like, if that would have happened during the podcast, just let it go. It's part of the story. It's what's actually happening. But being authentic is a part of living your meaning and living your corporation or person. And when you don't, it's that inauthenticity, right? So when you are working with your clients and when you're out there like talking about what matters in marketing, I imagine purpose has a lot to do with it. But can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like what, what why does marketing matter? Or what matters to market? Like wh- play around with that any way you th- see fit. What is it that matters? What matters is when a company has individuals that they are accountable to, let's talk about our full-time employees. Households are impacted by the employment at a company. I don't, it doesn't matter the business there, honestly. People's livelihoods depend on the success of businesses. What about marketing matters is that it has to connect and resonate and make meaning so that you are among choices. And th- this is interesting because, Dan, you're a choice in your business and what you do. I am a choice in the business and what I do. And in the world, like behind you, I can see a picture frame and I can see a drinking glass and I can see, you know, bookends. The companies that make those things, those are also choices. Amazon makes things so convenient and so available at our fingertips and everything else. And one of the things I like to say I help my companies do is become a handheld household name. Because when we're walking around with our smarter than you phones in our hands all the time, and people are holding us in their bubble. You know, I like to give an example when I do public speaking that you pick up the cell phone and I hold it in front of my face. I say, how far away from your face do you hold your cell phone? And people do this. I said, now who in your world do you let get that close to your face? So to a business, when a person invites you into their bubble, they take you to bed with them at night. Sometimes they wake up with you in the morning and they have coffee with you. And when you have the chance to be a part of someone's personal bubble close to their face in the palm of their hand, the content that you are using to represent your brand and your business, the words, the graphics, the colors, whatever, has to be able to catch or resonate with that individual person that makes you the best choice, not just a choice, but the best choice. And that's why it has to matter because In a world of choices, the only way to stay in business and keep our people employed and continue to work with the livelihoods or for the livelihoods of those that depend upon us and then the the consumers that depend upon us is to matter more than the choices. We have to matter more than the choices. Then, yeah, absolutely. And it's simple. That's not, there's no rocket science there. That's really, just break it down. I, I was working with a company recently. I said, how do you want people to think about your brand? Because the way I talk about marketing, marketing is like boot camp. It's training. We're training people. We're conditioning them. For the same reason why you go to a trainer to look a certain way, your marketing is the training for your potential customers. We are training our people how to think, speak, and behave about our business. This is like slide two of all my presentations. Training marketing is training your audience how to think, speak, and behave about your business. What are some things that you want your potential customers to think about your brand? What are some things you want your potential customers to be saying about your brand? And then give them. That's the best part of core messaging. Then you you create the language because if you don't give them the story to tell, they're going to tell their own story. (laughs) They always have. They always will. A hundred percent. So you just have to train them with the right language. And then that's what they know to parrot or repeat. And even if they paraphrase it or they use synonyms, the concept is still there. Yeah. So that messaging has to be resonating. That's the thing. Like we can talk about, I think this is a big, a big point really about the evolution of marketing and communications, right? So back in the day, and it certainly, I'm old enough to remember this, where you have 
just a handful of TV channels to choose from. The marketing job, the marketer would be to you know, that messaging you're talking about would just be thrown at you and inundated with you. And to this day, I don't know how many, you know, how many times this happens daily, probably, but you know, little commercial jingles will come unbidden into my memory. I mean, it happens all the damn time. From growing up, like watching Saturday morning. Yeah. Right. From growing up, say, watching Saturday morning. Morning cartoons. <laughs> From people teasing me because my last name was is looks like Nestle, but it's actually Nestle. So you know, I, you know, had a lot of Nestle Crunch things going on. Um, I, you know, and I, I, I can't get the, the hundred thousand dollar bar, you know, kind of commercial out of my head every once in a while. Anyway, like these things just stick with you. So the marketer back in those days is like that's how to train the audience is more of a, uh, a of a projection and kind of what's the word I'm looking for. Um, it was educating, but it was forcing that message through, right? So brainwashing is kind of what I'm looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the way commercials were then too, it was absolutely forcing it through and repetitious. It was just very repetitive. Yes. Yeah. So then that changes, right? So now, you know, as there's a continuum and it, as as time goes on, you know, the, the choices become more widely available. And as more choices are available, then there's competition in the messaging and start smart people, smart marketers and smart, you know, kind of writers and people who do copy start to understand, wait a second, my bit is going to get chosen more often than that bit because my bit is hitting some nerve or something somewhere, some emo emotion. So this this starts to evolve even more, you know. So you go from your five channels to your forty channels, but it's still very much push, right? Still very much like okay. But then of course everybody knows the internet happens, everything changes. Suddenly people have power to make their own choices and to create their own story, and that's exactly what happened. You said that if you're not given the messaging, the messaging will be created. Well, that is exactly what happened with. The early days of the internet, even now, social media comes along and gives people this platform to make their own stories. And, you know, before you know it, somebody's somebody's representing your brand right. who is not part of your company. And, you know, then the market's crazy. Oh, I need to get control of that. I need to wrestle control of that. And, but as as Mark would tell you, and and as anybody tells you, we're marketers are not in control and we have to understand that. So now you know, we've, we've come a long way in that, in that journey. We're still, we're still on it, but now it's, it's all about empowering the customer and, or the audience or the stakeholder, whoever, whoever it is, whichever part of that journey, your job or your messaging is trying to, to reach. It's about become being accepted by them. So I like that you said accepted because that was the concept right. that we discussed so intensely in the uprising was when you're developing your community, you have to be not just in the community, you have to be of the community. And while some people could probably say that differently with emphasis on the word in and be like, oh, now I, you know, I mean, you could change that around however you wanted, but to be of the community is to be seen and to be empathetically connected or understood by those that are doing business with you, whether that be a small town community, literally like the confines of the geographic borders of a town or the community of a brand. I think the embodiment of community can be interpreted in different ways there. But when you are of the community and you care and your values, back to that, are represented in the community and they resonate or other people see themselves in you, the brand, then that's how that community strengthens and grows, whether it uh, once again, be a physical location or conceptually online, a community. No. And people try. And boy, that's ugly. It's ugly when they do that. And you can't force that. You know, that's people try. It's ugly and it doesn't last. You know, so so when you think about it, right, and I said earlier, like, you know, we think about, okay, how am I going to get this message to the right people at the right place at the right time? I can't get to them. I have to understand what they want and what they need and what they're looking for. And then I have to trust that I have to bank on some serious skill, some good writing, some good visual, some good quality storytelling, which I believe and research tells me or other forces around me kind of give me the go that says, okay, this is what those people out there might respond to. I'm just going to say respond to. Yeah. 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 
Oh, right response. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, that's all we can hope for is a response sometimes, you know, but. And I love how you said good marketing and good ta- content, good, good graphics, because everything is subjective there. So now as the marketers, we're the ones that are saying, yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good. Let's try it. Let's see what sticks. You know that. Yeah, it is by no means, I think, widely accepted kind of story here. Like, I still think that so many folks out there who are in marketing and uh, and communications are still you know, operating by older models. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just like, okay, well, it's been working. It's going to keep working. Or, you know what I think I'll do? I think we'll increase our ad budget by X percent. Now, if you're working for a corporation, who doesn't want more money in their budget? Like getting more money in your budget is like a thing, but I don't, that's not what we want. What we want is success for our team and for our company. So if I could achieve exactly, if I could achieve more with less, then I'm then my team is going to be looked upon very favorably and the company is going to look up, be looked on favorably and it's all good, right? And then I'll probably, I could potentially get more because I achieve more with less, right? As a, the, just do more of that. Mm-hmm. How resourceful you were. Yeah, I mean, and success breeds success and all those good, really cool things to say, but it's really, it's really fascinating to me. And, and then just back to something about, about the, um, the uprising and being able to, you know, to, to kind of resonate with the right, re- like, being of the community, right? Being authentic and of the community. And something you said earlier about like every full-time employee represents food on the table, household. Like there's, that's why things matter, right? When it comes down to it, something that also came up in the uprising and that just reminded me, I think it was Minter Dial was talking about this, is this, and I always get this wrong too, but it's the E to B to B to C. I think I get that right. Is E to B to B to C? Or E to B to B to B to C. I think it's two Bs. E to B to B to C. If you say it fast enough, it sounds the same both ways. It does. That's the trick. (laughs) I have this written down, but I got to be, I have to tell you, Dan, my notes are not next to me from that, but I did write down what you said. So I can, I can sound clever. Yeah. The E to B to B to C thing. Yeah. The whole thing about, about employees come first. So the inside out approach to marketing. If you are, uh, you know, a solopreneur or something, you know, obviously you're not worrying too much about this whole thing, but you are the employee too. Like, so you are the brand. So it's sort of, it's a very condensed form of that inside out thing, right? You're just living it and you're cutting out the middleman. But when you have a large, any number of employees, whether it's five or 5,000, those employees are the first line of brand for you, of brand realization or actualization. And it's not just because, oh, they're a channel to go talk to other people. It's because they're li- they are literally dependent on the brand and their families are dependent on the brand. So, And the brand is dependent upon them. And I think that the great resignation has taught us that more than anything. Absolutely. That everything that Mentor was saying is that's the crux of the truth of the success of a business. And then what they provide as a product or a service needs to make an impact and be great and the way we tell the world that it's available at their fingertips is through effective marketing that matters. And that's how, so at Atomic Revenue, one of our things is that we align people, process, data, and technology for profitable growth. We also say we're unabashedly pro-profit. No, there's not. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we hire and fire, <laughs> as you said earlier, based on our core values, which is that we are wicked, smart, self-directed problem solvers. You know, we value all the things that those characteristics embody. And, you know, it would be really hard for me to say that there aren't any ways or blurred lines between, you know, the role that I play at Atomic Revenue Monday, Wednesday and Friday out of the week. And then the role that I play on Tuesdays and Thursdays for Fast Bryant Consulting. But that concept bleeds over into the way that April and I work also because it makes sense and it fits well into being ambitious and running a great business and having it be effective for the businesses. Because if we do well at our job, then the businesses we serve grow and everyone has an opportunity to try something they've never done before, which is, you know, hire more people or try a new product line or, you know, explore Uh, the next level of service. And when you're constantly in a position to do challenging work that's meaningful, and I keep saying meaningful, but challenging work that's meaningful, then I think that you said you're in the constant pursuit of knowledge. That satisfies some of that hunger, that human hunger to learn and know and grow and always be providing the 
the best version of yourself every single day in your business and to the people that you work with. And that's how you become of your community as a as an employee or as a business to represent. Yeah. Yeah. And you learn a lot. I mean, oh, you know, I have this little sticky in front of me all the time. It says, oh, that's good. He does. He just showed me his sticky note in the yeah. intentional curiosity. <laughs> yeah, I do. It's I'm not lying. It's underlined from a, a podcast I have with the, with I think it was Daryl Sweeney. We were talking about the difference between curiosity and judgment. I do love Ted Lasso. Right. Which is also from Ted Lasso, if anybody watched that. But uh, Ted Lasso is fantastic. It's just, there's this great section where he talks about the difference between, cur- between being curious and being judgmental. Go see it. Go watch it. I'm not going to talk about it much. But the idea is that going out there and being curious is I think a fundamental, another fundamental thing about connecting with your community and being of the community. But when it comes to your employees and, and the people that you're working with every day, that openness and the curiosity is a big part of that community building and being, being part of that whole thing. And that's why I thought about the uprising. I'm, I'm trying to sort of bring this to some place here. The uprising where we met Lauren is a collection. It was, it was a think tank of these fantastic global marketers and communicators speakers, authors. If this were in person, we'd be rubbing elbows, but instead we're sort of sharing screens with, you know, with the Mark Schaefer's and the Minter Dials and, you know, um, you know, the, the Evelyn Starr, Evelyn Starr. Oh man. How can I forget Evelyn? You know, like this fantastic people. But the thing to me, the thing that has that the real connector there is that every single one of those people is like, I am curious about what you want, what you are saying. Like everybody, I am curious about what Lauren has to say. And it's just like, nobody stood on any sort of ceremony. Everybody wanted to hear from everybody else. And um, I think that that's why that, that became a really, a really strong, uh, or it's becoming a very strong community. It absolutely is. And when someone comes to the table, as they did in our little, you know, Brady Bunch squares in our Zoom world that we lived in for three days, all of us has a little bit of expertise But we were able to pause and to paraphrase and to pose questions and put ideas on the table. And everyone was asking questions to one another, even in the breakout sessions. And I think the really fascinating part about that, from my perspective, was to hear how the marketers in other countries and then even other parts of the United States were experiencing post-pandemic marketing or witnessing what the future of AI was going to look like for you know our roles as human marketers. Mm-hmm. So to, to talk about the uprising specifically, that community was strengthened and was so inspiring from newbie uh, graduate student to the most respected speakers, authors, coaches in the marketing world because everyone had something of value to offer. And from a niche perspective, Dan, all of us had one perspective that was unique or different or like, this is my thing and this is what I talk about and that's your thing and that's what you talk about. And, you know, on a whole, it's all very connected, but, you know, we are all very specific, tiny little gears in this magical world that is the uprising. Oh, yeah. And I think it is certainly a microcosm for the future of marketing and communications, which which brings me to like the last thing I really wanted to, t- to ask you about, because you know, at the uprising, uh, we all had a lot of great things to say, but we thought about the future and we, we thought about where this whole thing is going. You mentioned AI in your interactions with your clients and your businesses and stuff. I mean, what is it that you are seeing? Like, what is it that that you think we should all be either either, you know, choose, choose the either either the what should we be scared of? Or what should we be super excited about? Or, or maybe a mix? Like, what do you think? I don't know that I have anything that I fear. Uh, now, when we talked about the, you know, the computer generated people that are selling products. Oh, yeah. I have to tell you, I have so little, there's very little exposure to it in my daily life that, no, thank you. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> That's true. Uh, I mean, oh, here, here's, here's what I'm saying. Here's what I mean. <laughs> I don't yeah. watch regular channels. I don't have cable. I have a Hulu that I stream live sports on and I work a lot in social media because that's where my business takes place. But I read a lot and I hike a lot and I'm outdoors and I'm, I'm able to disconnect. I think that at this point, I am very uh, delusionally participating in what I think is real life. <laughs> there, I'll say that. Yeah. Good for you. 
So I wasn't scared of anything. I think it's fascinating. Humans came up with that. How cool is that? That was the the this is not a person dot com. I think that was like the the website. There was you can look you can look it up. There's a the, just for for the listeners here. AI has just taken basically amalgamations of people and created new people. So a lot of the advertising that you see, or some of the not a lot, but some advertising that you can see. Yes, some of the ad that you can see and that you're exposed to on various platforms, certainly Instagram, but a lot of others may feature people who aren't real human shapes that are not actually real individuals. <laughs> yeah. There's even a few that are that are actual influencers. And those are, I think are well, I forget what they are, but those are well known as, as AI, right? But there are like in stock photos or in some other, you know, some still images you see like where it looks like, hey, here's the person. It's not a person. I love that you said stock photos because one of the things that I focus on in all the work that I do is original imagery. Not, not just that, you know, we had a photo shoot, but like authentic with that same style of like, I took this with my cell phone and this is what it actually is going to look like when you see it uh, to avoid that plastic glossy look. Yeah. And do you think there's a future in that? Do you think that's like, like we'll be able to tell in the future the difference? I want to say yes. I want to say yes. I really do. I, so here's where I'm headed and this is what I can see working. The scary part for some businesses is to really reveal who they are or to be truly transparent. Some companies thrive on their transparency. That's how they operate. They say things like, I hire and fire based on my values. I mean, they say that. But companies that have a product or service offering that use colloquialisms. And the thing I love the most, you asked me what, my, what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about the language, the words, the nuance in the words, the, the structure of the sentences. And I'm not I use Grammarly like everybody else does. I'm not talking about like the beauty and punctuation, but the language that a brand can use to talk about themselves and to tell a powerful six word story, if you will. I think that the more that a company can niche down and say very specific things that zings their audience, blows their mind, strikes a chord, that takes work. That's hard to do because you can't just, you know, throw those off the top of your head all the time. I think the easy thing to do is say, I want to be the trusted neighbor. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, that's bogus. Nobody cares. You want to be a trusted neighbor. Peel that onion and tell me what's really underneath that. What do you really want people to know about you? That is where I think people, businesses, marketers will thrive if they embrace, and this would be what Mark would say, just the human element of the language or the way that you imagine your customer speaks, or how you want your customer to speak. What are the things you think your customer is saying? And then talk to them that way. Have you ever talked to MK John, Mary Catherine? She was, she was on the, at the, at the um, uprising as well. And she, um, her, her specialty, one of her specialties is chatbots. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, as soon as you said that, I'm like, I recognize. Yeah, I can, perfect, I can see the, the light bulb uh, going off. She said something quite similar about words, right? Just being able to, to speak in the words of the customer, the voice of the customer or, or, the, or the, the audience, the stakeholder, et cetera. It's such a critically important thing. And, and I think that's why we who are fundamentally word people, when, it, when you boil it down, when you boil that ocean, what's left is words that marketers use, marketers and communicators both. You know, it's about the stories that we weave and the words that we use to persuade and to, and to, and to kind of educate and so on. So those words are so important. If you ever go to willrobotstakemyjob.com, I think that's the URL, there's a like a 98% chance that if you're an accountant, and I'm sorry for all my accountants out there who I lo know and love and who are certainly probably listening, there's like a 96% chance that robots are going to take your job. If you're a marketer or a writer, it's the inverse. It's like a two or 3%. It's like because they can't do it. Like in, in as much as there is some AI that's like writing stuff these days, it's not the same thing. That's still a bridge that's probably too far. I'm not, I'm, and I, now I will, I'll never say never, but I think, you know, I, I, I think that's an interesting kind of point about, about the future and about the importance of language and words. And, and it's really important. But I, I'm looking at the future now and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we've been on for like over an hour and, and I can't believe how fast this conversation has gone. And I'm, I'm so happy that you joined me, Lauren. It was so much fun to talk to you and, li and listen to your story. Uh, for my listeners out there, uh, you can find Lauren on LinkedIn, Lauren Fast, 
And it's just like, it's speed, fast, and but her, her name will be uh, spelled properly in the episode title anyway. Go to Fast Bryant Consulting. That's uh, fastbryantconsulting.com. And again, that's going to be in the uh, in the show notes, but uh, it's, it's fast, then Bryant with a Y, consulting.com and atomicrevenue.com. Yes, absolutely. Is that right? Yeah. So- any place else? Where where else can people find you? Oh, my image world, the makeup that I do. I live on Instagram for that, and that's at the Lauren Fast. At the Lauren Fast. Someone else had Lauren Fast, so I figured I would take the Lauren Fast. That's probably better. The is I actually uh, I I prefer it as a digital real estate name. The Lauren Fast. That's me. Yeah. The Lauren Fast. It's pretty good. Yeah. So the at the Lauren Fast uh, at Instagram or you know Lauren Fast on, on LinkedIn wherever like wherever you go I'm sure that you can find Lauren she's a digital and social uh, like kind of expert and so on so use any any search engine I'm sure that you will be able to locate her yeah I dabble in the digitals yeah Dan this has been really I am so honored and grateful <laughs> I, I I'm I'm sort of sitting here with like my hand over my mouth like just listen let him talk listen. And I'm just, I'm like, thank you so much. Oh, I loved it. This was great. Well, I'm glad. And um, look, it's always great to meet kindred souls, kindred spirits. And um, we certainly are that. And I'm, I've, I've had a great time talking to you. I'm really looking forward to hanging out in person in April um, at the, at the, at the real uh, in-person uprising and um, shout out to Mark Schaefer, who may, may at one time or another, eventually ultimately listen to my podcast. You know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but you know, but me having several of the uprising guests on may actually kind of get his get his attention. The guy's really busy. Uh, but um, thank you so much. This has been so good. I'm so glad you came. Thank you. And to your audience of listeners, I am so grateful for them to just be also, as you said, kindred spirits. Anyone that would get this far is also a kindred spirit. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Troopers, troopers all. Awesome, Lauren, man. thank you so very much.